Welcome to Legal Connect, where each week we sit down with top lawyers to demystify the process of hiring and working with legal counsel in today's world. From navigating the legal system to understanding your rights, our expert guests will provide valuable insights and tips for anyone facing a legal challenge. So tune in, take notes, and join us as we explore the ins and outs of the legal profession. A quick disclaimer, anything discussed in the podcast is general tips and advice, not formal legal advice. Always consult a lawyer. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Legal Connect podcast. I just wanted to give a quick disclaimer that this episode does contain themes of a sensitive nature. We talk about sexual assault, sexual harassment, and cases of gender-based violence. Um, So just please be mindful of that when listening to this episode, if any of those things um, are triggering for you. So I'm very excited today to introduce our guest, um, Nicole. She is a human rights lawyer at Ross McBride, and she's going to here to share all about um, what it's like to work both as a human rights lawyer and what kind of cases people might come to her for and how she can help support them. So welcome, Nicole, to the podcast. Thank you, Rochelle. Thanks for having me and hello to everyone listening. Awesome. So yeah, let's kind of just start with the basics. I'd love to just kind of hear a little bit more about your background. So introduce yourself and how you end up getting into the legal profession and more specifically into um, the area where you practice now, which is human rights. Yeah, so I actually, I, I've been a lawyer now, I'm, I'm in my third year. So I qualified uh, and became licensed uh, in Ontario to practice in 2020, um, right in the middle of the pandemic. Um, but before that, I had a 20 year career working as a counselor and an advocate for um, folks who had experienced gender based violence. Um, so I started when I was 18 years old um, as a counselor uh, on a rape crisis line. And um, while that was obviously challenging and difficult and, and harrowing for all the reasons you could imagine, um, it was also an incredible experience for me to be able to help and support people. Um, I got some excellent training from the rape crisis center that I was working at um, in, in trauma work. Um, and it became a really big interest of mine to support folks who had been traumatized and abused. Um, so then I started um, working in the criminal courts with um, victims and witnesses who were having to testify um, and provided support through the Victim Witness Assistance Program. I did that for many years in and out of my schooling and education. Um, and so all of that really led me, first of all, to become qualified uh, through a George Brown program to become a counselor and an advocate for, at that time, it was abused women and children, but I include uh, gender diverse folks in my work as well. Um, and yeah, this is a really long answer, but this, this is an interesting path that it, that led me here is an important one, really, that gives you context for, for why I do this work. Um, so yeah, I, I also... Uh, provided a lot of counseling and support within the um, shelter space for uh, women who were fleeing domestic violence. Um, I also provided counseling uh, as an intake counselor for the Barbara Schleifer Commemorative Clinic in Toronto, which um, is a a violence against women support uh, center that that does amazing work. Um, And then I decided I would go after that, I, I sort of became a little jaded, frankly, and saw that the system was letting folks down all too often and a lot of the clients that i was seeing were falling between the cracks and i realized that you know the law needed to be changed and addressed and so i decided to become a lawyer so i went to england and i studied law in london um, at king's college london um, which was wonderful and then um after that i still didn't think i actually wanted to be a lawyer i was more interested in policy change and research and i thought i i couldn't do that while practicing i thought it was more like academic stuff I was I was maybe thinking of. So I started working there with pregnant people that were fleeing domestic violence and, and really enjoyed that work. And while I was doing that, I also did a master's in human rights law um, at the University College London. And then after that, I went to China for a year and um, did some work uh, teaching critical thinking to Chinese high school students while I finished my master's. Wow. And then um, Coming back to Toronto, I was working in a child abuse charity. So again, supporting child victims uh, of abuse, going through uh, testifying in criminal court. But then I started managing the human trafficking program, which is also really um, interesting and insightful into like the incredible dangers that youth face in terms of being trafficked, which we can maybe talk about a little bit more. All of that is what led me to become a lawyer because then I finally realized um, the system's not going to change unless I get in there and, and, and ruffle some feathers. And, and, you know, one person can only do so much. There's lots of really amazing lawyers doing incredible advocacy work, but I wanted to be a part of that. So um, 
that led me to where I am. And that's why I practice human rights law because um, social justice is my absolute main passion and priority. And I really still wanna help people who have experienced injustices, discrimination, violence, and abuse. And I want to help them find creative ways to seek justice uh, beyond you know, the criminal process, which may or may not achieve that for them. Right. Well, wow. First of all, you've had quite the extensive career, but also extensive life experience. That's quite the uh, the journey you've been on in the last, you said, 20 years since you first. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. Good for you. And um, yes. like, how do you think that that, you know, especially your work as a counselor, like obviously you've been an advocate for your whole life, it sounds like, and you've had this, you know, social justice lens that you're bringing to everything. But how do you think that that has really um, kind of affected how you now work as a lawyer, like I'd imagine even like some of those skills that you bring, you know, from being a counselor versus just a lawyer who's never had that would be quite different, right? Hugely different. Yeah. Yeah. Hugely different. I think, and, and every lawyer is going to have different qualities. So I think really as, as a potential client, you have to think about like, what is it that you need the most? Um, and I'm, I'm not perfect. No one is right. So, so perhaps, uh, where my strengths lie, you know, some of my colleagues, for example, might be better at certain things and, and I'll lean on them. Or that's why I actually, I love working at a firm because I can partner with people and, and we can bring both our strengths and skills. But I would say, yeah, the, the huge benefit to my experience leading up to being a lawyer is that I, I, I approach my work with incredible compassion, like true genuine compassion and, uh, and empathy for folks. And, and I get that feedback from clients a lot that they feel heard and they feel listened, um, to, um, and, you know, I, I think a lot of lawyers, particularly ones that maybe don't have training in, in counseling, which is understandable. Um, they, they might say, well, I don't have time, you know, because everything, unfortunately for lawyers is docketed hours and, and billings. And, you know, I, okay, every, every, you know, I don't know if people listening know this, but you have to basically track your time in six minute increments. Um, and that's, challenging and, and it's stressful and it's, you know, oh gosh, oh, okay, well, I'm, I'm now I'm, now I'm talking and supporting somebody, but this is taking more than six minutes. You know, it's, it's an awful way to think, but it's, it's unfortunately the way the system's set up. Um, but I don't believe that it's a waste of time. Obviously it, it's incredibly important to give people the time and space um, to, to talk about their experiences and to, and, and to discuss their disappointment with systems. Uh, sometimes things don't go well and, and we need to be there to debrief and to support. Um, but I also think that even in, in hearing a client's experience and talking to them a little bit more about like, how did that make you feel? And, and, and validating their experience. Actually, we get to a more personal story that isn't just the same as every other story. And so when I put that on paper, I think it has more power. I think it conveys more um, to the judge or the decision maker, depending on where we're going, a tribunal or a court. Um, I think it conveys to them what this person really experienced and who this person is, um, because all they're getting at, at the outset is paper. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's, it's really important to put that personality and that, that descriptive, element of, of what people experience and, and the emotional impact that it has on them. Yeah. And I think like you mentioned that emotional impact is so important because in cases like this, it's, it's very complex, right? It's not always so cut and dry. And that overall context or the, the story of what kind of led up to these events is more important almost sometimes I feel like than the actual action that happened, right? It's, it's all, everything surrounding it, right? Mm -hmm. Context. Yeah. It's important. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Well, that's, yeah, that's amazing that you've, that you've come this far and you've done all this work. Um, and I'm sure we can learn a ton from you today. So I'm very excited to kind of just jump into all of this. Yes. Um, so I guess like just kind of start at the beginning for people like myself, first of all, but then people who might be listening to this who don't really understand fully like what a human rights lawyer does and in what situations you might need to um, seek out a human rights lawyer. Can you kind of just give us some context about why people would seek you out? Yeah, it's a great question because actually before I became a lawyer and I talked to you a little bit about how I resisted becoming a lawyer because I thought I don't want to work in like a corporate firm. That's not what I want to do. I don't want to do corporate law. Um, yeah. I didn't even really know, <laughs> you know that I could be a human rights lawyer. So a very good question that I, I think probably most people don't know. Um, so, yeah, so let's imagine for, okay, so thinking about Ontario, we have the human rights code. Um, and that code provides protections for people um, from experiencing discrimination or sexual harassment um, 
in certain areas. So it doesn't, for example, if I was walking down the street and and someone shouts at me and, and calls me awful things that have to do with being a woman, for example, because that's one of the identities that is protected under the code um, is your sex. Um, then uh, I, you know, I, I don't have any recourse with the Human Rights Code. The Human Rights Code doesn't protect from general statements of discrimination in the public, but it does protect you from things like any discrimination or sexual harassment that you experience in the workplace, um, any discrimination or harassment that you experience through any service. So that includes a wide range of things on the bus. Uh, at a hospital or a doctor's office or any kind of um, service that you're accessing, restaurants, bars, a store, um, all of that it, uh, you're protected from. And I don't think a lot of people know that. Sometimes they think, oh, that person was awful or I feel horrible. But, you know, it's not a crime necessarily. It's not against the law in terms of criminal process. I can't call the police. Um, but there are there are things and there's recourse for you. And we'll talk about more about what those are later. But um it also covers, um, you know, unfair treatment by your union if you're unionized. Um, it can operate in conjunction with the union. So even though you are unionized, you can still access um, support through the Human Rights Tribunal. Yes. Um, and also it covers things like um, education, which I think is really important to mention. So, um, you know, parents who have kids who perhaps have disabilities and are trying to navigate, uh, you know, accommodations for them within education, that's covered. Um, bullying within schools, things like that, um, that all engages the code. And then the other thing that I'll mention about the Human Rights Code is that, um, again, you have to have what's called a protected ground. So there are 17 in total. I'm not going to list them all off because, well, I don't have them all memorized. <laughs> That'd be yes. an interesting test for me. Maybe I could come up with them. But, yeah. um, uh, you know, some, some include race, ethnic origin, citizenship, uh, sex, gender identity, um, sexual orientation. Um, the, the, the ground of sex also includes pregnancy. So pregnancy in the workplace, for example, and discrimination, being fired uh, because you're pregnant, not just being pregnant and being fired. It has to be one of the reasons that your employer fires you, but that's also protected. Um, so, so yeah, I think that kind of gives you a really general overview of the human rights process and code in Ontario and the ways in which you might be able to engage with it and, and seek recourse if you've been not just unfairly treated, but uh, discriminated against. Yeah. And I think you're so right that most people don't know that there are protections that exist for that kind of stuff. Because exactly like you said, people say, OK, well, it's not quite a crime. You know, they know that it's wrong. They know it's discriminatory, but they don't feel like it's severe enough to seek out a lawyer because it's, it's not a crime per se. Right. So that's right. really great to know that these resources like or that resource exists and then that human rights lawyers um, do exist. Because I think for me, the idea in my head I had of a human rights lawyer is someone who is like, you know, off in like um, Iraq, like defending human rights or something like that. Or like in like a war torn area, like somewhere yeah. where it's, um, that's what I was kind of imagining in my head. But you don't think of those incidents that just happen every single day that are discrimination, right? Mm -hmm. so. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's a really good point. Like there's international human rights lawyers, which are really what you were just referring to. And honestly, that's sort of what I kind of thought I would have to do if I wanted to do human rights. Because again, I, I just wasn't familiar as much. And that's, you know, I have two law degrees. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't know that. So, um, so yeah, it really important. And, and that's part of my passion of trying to like spread the word that these things exist. You have rights, use them. Exactly. And, and a lot of, I feel like a lot of the populations that would experience this, they might not always have access to those resources of knowing those things exist too, right? Like we were never in school presented with the human rights code for your province and been like, Hey, did you know that all these things uh, you have a right to, you know, you have a right to not be discriminated against in these areas. Like we're not ever given that information anywhere. So how would Good we point. know, right? Um, yeah. and, and I guess like for you, like one thing you touched on and we talked about it a bit before we started recording the podcast today is um, knowing when to seek out a criminal lawyer and what constitutes a crime versus where you come in as a human rights lawyer and how do those things work together and how are they different, I guess? Yeah, that's a good question. I, yeah, because so, I mean, so for example, there could be a crime committed. Um, let's take the example of, you know, you're in a workplace uh, you identify as a woman and you are experiencing sexual harassment from your boss. Um, now, that sexual harassment uh, could certainly constitute a crime uh, of sexual assault if there was unwanted touching, for example. Um, and you could 
you're within your right to call the police and the police would investigate. And if they felt it was, um, you know, it, it substantiated a crime, then they would, they would lay charges and there would be a criminal process, but equally, um, and not exclusively. So you don't, you don't, you don't have to do one or else you can't do the other. You could, you could decide not to call the police. A lot of, you know, almost all sexual assault survivors do not call the police. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, but it, you know, so other than that, you could also, or instead of, um, you could, you could, um, file a human rights complaint against the employer, um, and against the boss as an individual as well. Um, and, and yeah, so that, that's completely available and open to you. The other thing with sexual assault is that you could also sue them civilly, um, in, in civil court. And there's different pros and cons to that. Like you can obviously usually get more money if you sue somebody civilly. Um, but it's a longer process. It's less accessible. It's more expensive. And there's some cost risks. Like if you lose, um, you may be ordered to pay the other side's legal costs. Whereas in the human rights tribunal context, you don't, um, you don't, you're not on the line for that, but equally the other side doesn't have to pay your legal costs. Um, so it really depends on the case. What are the details? How strong of a case do you have? How severe was it? Um, those are the kinds of things that you would need to think about as an individual experiencing this, but also well worth a chat, at least with a lawyer to explore the different options and what the pros and cons are based on how strong the case is. Yeah. And can you explain a little bit more about how the tribunal system works? Because it's, yeah. I know it's different than court again, um, but do you have like kind of the option to pursue either or is human yeah. rights or are human rights cases usually... Um, brought to a tribunal? How does that kind of... Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for asking that. Um, so yeah. So when... Um, so the first step is if, if you've experienced discrimination um, and it is protected under the Human Rights Code and everybody should look up the Human Rights Code and read about it, um, then your first step is to file an application with the Human Rights Tribunal. So to file an application is basically a complaint. And, and what it does is it establishes all of the things that happen to you um, in your own voice. And it describes them with dates. Dates are very important. On this date, this happened. On this date, this happened. Um, and then if you can, um, this is when a lawyer is helpful, but you can do these things by yourself as well. Um, then it's really important to connect what happened to what it how it, how it's protected under the code. So is it discrimination? Why is it discrimination? Talk about that. Um, the Human Rights Commission, the Ontario Human Rights Commission, if you Google them, they have an amazing website with tons of information. They've written policies on pretty much every code ground. So disability in schools, um, a failure to accommodate at work, sexual harassment in the workplace, um, discrimination by your landlord in housing context. And in there, they give you cases, they give you descriptions of exactly how to talk about discrimination. And if you, this is a little pro tip, if you quote that commission in your application, then the Human Rights Tribunal has to consider it. They have to consider the policies that are in there. So that's a, that's a really helpful thing. Um, I will say that after you file that application, actually, I have a really helpful um, infographic that maybe I can somehow provide to you or in the show notes. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Because the infographic is really useful to show you each step in the human rights tribunal process. But basically, after you file the application, um, the tribunal will review it. Sometimes that takes quite a long time because there's a lot of delays right now. But eventually, when they've finished reviewing it and they decide it's complete, they will send it to the respondent. The respondent is the person that you're saying discriminated against you or is responsible for that. Um, they send it to them and then they have time to write a response, which, you know, prepare yourself is always the opposite of what you say, even if it's lies, it, it just is. This is, we all have two sides of every story, right? So sometimes that's hard to get and receive and read. But the nice thing about the setup is that you have the last chance to, to state your word. So you have a chance to reply to that response. And then that closes the first process, which we call those pleadings, those those documents that sort of describe what happened. It's yeah. not at that point a chance to try and prove what happened or to state your opinions about what happened. Try and keep to the facts. 
After that, um, as long as both sides agree, and usually they do, eventually it gets put through to mediation. And mediation is just um, a, a formal meeting where um, you're trying to reach an agreement to settle the case. So you're talking about money here, and I'll get into that in a minute about the remedies of the Human Rights Tribunal, but you're talking about money. You're also talking about non-monetary um, remedies like perhaps you want to be reinstated in your job because you were fired and you think that wasn't fair, or you want the promotion that you missed out on because you feel you were discriminated against because of your race. Um, there might be things like that. Um, there might also be accommodations that you're seeking. For example, your, your child is in school and requires extra supports for learning. Um, so you want those put in place. Those could be requests that you're making. And then of course, there's public interest remedies. So those could include things like policy change. Um, you know, you want the organization to do an overhaul of its sexual assault policy and harassment policy. Um, you want uh, the organization to get an expert in human rights to provide training on a specific area of human rights, like discrimination or the duty to accommodate. Um, so there's all those things that you can ask for. But remember that a mediation is voluntary. So you don't have to go and they don't have to go. Um, but if they do, then what happens is you come on the day, it's usually by Zoom these days, and there's an official adjudicator from the Human Rights Tribunal, but they're not there to decide, they're, ju they're just there to help navigate the process. And um, you don't really have to speak in front of the person that discriminated against you, you're in different breakout rooms, um, but you would present with the help of a lawyer if you have one, um, your first offer, um, and then it sort of goes back and forth and you see if you can reach a resolution. And if you do, then the case is resolved. You get whatever X things you asked for. It's not what you ask for, by the way, it's always less. This is a settlement. No one walks away completely satisfied from mediations, I have to say that. But sometimes it's better because it's guaranteed. It's like a guaranteed solution and you can move on with your life um, as long as you feel comfortable with, with what's been offered. Um, if that doesn't work out, then um, you go through to a hearing, which is like a trial. All of this happens at the tribunal. So there are adjudicators at the tribunal that make these decisions. They are like judges, but for the tribunal. Um, and whatever decision they make at a hearing is final. They, you know, it, it, it's an order that they create. So they could, for example, order the party to, to pay you $10,000 for pain and suffering. That is called general damages and that's tax free money. So, so it's not taxed. Um, the other thing worth, and, and actually just because it's final doesn't mean you have no recourse after that. If you don't like the decision, um, there is always the option to either ask for a reconsideration, so to ask the tribunal to reconsider their decision, or sometimes you can do what's called a judicial review. And I have to say, in terms of, because I'm quite passionate about access to justice issues, and I, I just think, you know, how many people, I don't know if you know what a judicial review is, but like most people that I encounter don't. And unfortunately, it's also held against them more often than not, where, you know, I'll, I'll read a document from a respondent and they'll say, well, they, they could have judicially reviewed it, but they didn't. But I just, I, you, how do you know what a judicial review is? Basically, it's where you can have a, a divisional court, which is like a higher court, review a decision, any official decision that's been made, whether that's by a tribunal or let's say you're on ODSP and a decision is made that you don't like. You can have that reviewed. You can ask. There are appeal processes, but you usually only have 30 days, 30, three zero uh, to, yeah, to seek an appeal or to seek a judicial review. Um, so it, it's something that just has to be in the back of your head. Oh, Nicole said on that podcast, there's something I can do, but it's only 30 days. Call a lawyer, call me, ask yeah. me and I'll, I'll tell you if there's an option, but time is limited. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. the thing too. I, I think why it'd be so valuable to have a lawyer to guide you through this process. And I would assume for, for you kind of detailing this process that are you, that you can work with anybody throughout the entire thing from when they first go to the, like submit the complaint to the tribunal, like all the way to the end, I would assume. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So typically, um, typically people contact me, um, before they've decided to, to pursue, uh, the process, they might not even know that the process exists, but they think I've been really wronged here. There's something wrong. I, I need to figure out if there's anything I can do. Yes. Um, 
And then, yeah, I would help them draft the application, file the application, help them review the response, help them draft the reply, uh, help. There's a lot of sometimes procedural things that happen along the way that that you don't expect, like the other side asks for uh, an advanced order on something and you have to write legal submissions about it. That's where it gets a little complicated and harder to represent yourself. There are other people that are a bit more legal savvy and want to do it themselves and they want to save some money. So they'll, I've had a few things happen. Like, I think this is, you know, a helpful thing to think about in terms of being creative is that you could, for example, write the application yourself and have a lawyer review it. I've done that for people where I've just reviewed it and provide edits and comments, and then they just go ahead and file it themselves as a self-represented litigant. Um, or I've had a situation where, you know, further down the road, things get complicated. They've already filed the application. They've already got the response, but now they have to do the reply. And a lot of the things in the response were legal and complicated. And so they want a lawyer to help them and, and come on board and represent them for the rest of the case. So it's not like, oh, but I didn't start with a lawyer. Um, yeah. So I can't get one. Of course you can. You can get one at any time. You can also decide halfway through, you don't want a lawyer anymore and you can yeah. do it yourself. Like the, the the decisions are up to you, but I, I feel like maybe that's a good segue to get into the cost. Um, yes, I, was, I was about to ask that as well, especially like, yeah. hearing, like you outline these different approaches that you can take. Cause like, mm -hmm. I imagine that a lot of times or more often than not people who are filing a human rights complaint or report is people that are in a marginalized population or they're, well, obviously they are, we know that they're a uh, protected, um, what do you call protected group? Or protect, protected population. A ground, yeah, protected ground. Yeah, so I would imagine that would also sometimes correspond to being a lower socioeconomic status as well. Is that yeah. accurate or? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Not always, but yes, absolutely. Like a lot of a lot of clients uh, from equity uh, deserving groups perhaps are are in, in, in lower economic situations, especially like, for example, like the Human Rights Code protects against housing discrimination. But it, within the housing context, we're usually talking about people who are renting um, or who are in social housing and on, obviously have have less money. Um, so yeah, there's a few options. Um, and I can't promise that this is what you would be offered if you spoke to me or any other human rights lawyer, but it's certainly an option, which is contingency fee. So you may have heard this in the context of personal injury lawyers, they all do contingency fee, which is, if you don't win, I don't get paid. Um, but yeah. <laughs> yes, like the billboards. Exactly. We don't we don't tend to do billboards in the human rights community. <laughs> Maybe we should. <laughs> yeah. You know a little bit more, at least, about the human rights process. Oh, but um, but what I can tell you is that we we have a similar approach with a lot of our clients, not all of them. And I'll tell you why in a minute. But um, what that basically means is that when you when you come, if it's an appropriate case for contingency fee, um, then you don't pay any money up front. Um, mm -hmm. You're not on the hook for any money. So if you lose, you don't have to pay us. Um, if you decide you want to stop, you don't have to pay us. But um, if you were to be successful, then you would have to um, pay a percentage of whatever you get um, to the firm or to the lawyer, uh, depending on who the lawyer is and if they're in a firm or not, um, yeah. to cover the legal fees. And that percentage is agreed upon at the very outset when you sign the retainer. A retainer is just a contract between you and a lawyer. Um, and uh, so everything's sort of spelled out, like, okay, this is how it'll work. Sometimes, you know, if if you decide halfway through, you know what, I don't want the lawyer anymore, I'm going to stop, but then you are successful, you would still have to pay the lawyer for 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 their work up to the point that you, you fired them. But um, of course, if you weren't successful, you don't owe anything. Um, yes. That's a really wonderful way to make this accessible to people. Obviously, it also takes away from what you finally get at the end of the day. But the way I see it is, your chances of getting something are much more increased if you have a lawyer by your side, truly, because the system is really complex and complicated and, and hard to navigate. Um, and I'll just say, so in terms of deciding if something is contingency fee or not, um, it's really up to each individual lawyer. And it depends a lot on how much work is involved. Is it a really complicated case with lots and lots of legal arguments that are going to take 
many, many, many hours. Maybe we need more resources and we just, we can't, uh, we can't justify it on contingency fee because we don't think it'll um, get you enough money that it'll actually cover what we need to cover. Um, it could be that the case isn't very strong, but you still feel like you really want to go for it. Um, we're happy to support you, but in those cases, probably we would have to do an hourly rate. Um, quite often, sometimes in those cases where we can't do contingency fee, we can reduce our hourly rate. Um, so you have that flexibility, that's nice. Yes, yeah. we do have that flexibility, but again, it's an individual chat that would, would need to be had with a lawyer to, to really decide, okay, how, how can we go forward? And, and at, at the end of the day, it is the lawyer's decision to, to provide you with whatever option, and then you get to decide if, if that's a good fit for you or not. Yeah. And, and the last question I have about costs is, um, aside from, you know, contingency fees being a tool and like the lawyer being willing to reduce their hourly rate, um, mm -hmm. are there kind of like public or government funding or grants or programs available, like similar to the, how, how there's government supports for other things? Is there funding that you can apply for or access if you want to go and you don't have the money, let's say, to file a human rights um, claim, but you want to? Great question. Yes. So if you're very low income, then you and you could qualify for legal aid, but you do have it's quite a high bar uh, or low bar, I guess um, you have to. Anyway, you have to be very low income and, and they do consider the assets you have. So if you own a house, for example, they could put a lien against your house, which not everyone is comfortable with. Mm -hmm. um, but legal aid is available. There are legal clinics who can represent people in low income situations who need or want to pursue human rights. Um, through the tribunal and they'll represent. So so look into legal clinics. That's a really good option um, if, if you qualify. Uh, the other thing to mention is the Human Rights Legal Support Center. They don't always represent people, but they give a lot of helpful information over the phone, by email. Um, you can call them with questions. So if you do want to represent yourself, you could call them throughout the process and say, I just got this response and I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And they can help walk you through the next steps. They also have a really helpful website that lays out, okay, now you're going to a preliminary hearing. Here's all the steps you have to do. Make sure you do this by this date. Make sure you prepare witness statements. Make sure that you're, you know, reading case law. Here's where to find the case law. So, so there are really helpful tools that you can access as well. Yeah. Well, I think you, I would say you've already provided an excellent resource by even just clearly outlining how this process works. But then it's nice that you've also been sharing these resources for people to access if they just want to learn more about it. Mm -hmm. uh, but now that you've kind of covered some of the general processes and how it works and how working with a human rights lawyer might work, um, I kind of want to get into some more like maybe specific questions or scenarios people might be potentially facing. And I'm sure that these are things that you've dealt with um, throughout your career so far. So, um, but going into the workplace specifically, because I think this is probably one that's very common is harassment. Sadly, it is common, but harassment against um, women or um, people of other genders in the workplace and people being afraid that they're going to lose their job if they, you know, file a claim against their employer or their boss or whatever it is. Um, I know you said that people can be reinstated in their job potentially, but I would imagine it'd be quite hard and there would be some like resentment afterwards if they try mm -hmm. and match the job. So is that like a common fear of people that come to you for that reason? Or how do you kind of approach that, um, that situation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's really tricky when you're in a job and um, you're experiencing something and you maybe want to stay in the job. Like it, it, it becomes really complicated when you file a complaint um, to stay. <laughs> Uh, it's not impossible. You're completely within your right to stay in the job. Um, but things become a little uncomfortable, right? Because all of a sudden you started a legal action against your employer and that's going to just create a really added tension, not to mention whatever you've experienced or are experiencing. Um, so there's that to consider. Um, one of the things that sometimes people do in those situations where things have gotten so bad that they've actually decided to reach out to a lawyer and, and take action is they want to try and negotiate an end to their employment um, mm -hmm. as part of settling the whole thing. So it's it, it's not that they're just looking for general damages, but they're looking for you know a termination package, a severance package basically that provides them with pay in lieu of notice and, and helps them just move on with their lives. Um, that's something to consider, but not everybody wants that. Um, the other thing that you touched on that's really important to note is um, something called reprisal. So if you uh, try and enforce one of your code rights, so for example, your right not to be sexually harassed against um, or discriminated against because of your sex or your gender identity or your race or whatever it might be, if you say something 
about it. Like you go to your boss and you say, this is racism or this is sexual harassment. I need it to stop or whatever it is. You make a complaint and then all of a sudden you're fired or you're uh, missing out on a promotion that you were definitely going to get or whatever it is. If some, something happens where you're like, wait a minute, I'm being punished because I just said something. Or maybe you're worried about saying something because you will be punished. A few things. We can't stop your boss from breaking the law. So unfortunately, it does happen a lot. Um, and I can't, I can't promise you that it's not going to just because the law says they shouldn't. Um, but there is part of the code that says reprisal is not allowed. And reprisal is another ground that you can claim in your human rights applications. So along with discrimination on the basis of whatever ground or grounds, like for example, it could be race, gender identity, and disability. You could have all of those things and have experienced discrimination. Then you should list all of those things when you file your application, but it can also be reprisal. Uh, the only other thing I'll say is reprisal is harder to prove because you have to prove that the person intended to reprise against you, to punish you. Um, yes. And yeah. the other things, discrimination, for example, you don't have to prove that intent. Um, so it's a little easier. But anyway, it's not something to be scared of. If, if it happened to you, you could still try. Uh, but that's anyway, there's a protection there to to try and stop people from reprising against you, for punishing you, for for raising your your rights. Yeah. And that's good to know. Cause at least like, uh, yeah, you, like you said, even if it's not always followed, at least you know that there is something in place to yeah. to support. And I would imagine that most people would probably end up wanting to leave the job, like you said, anyways. So it's good to know they can kind of negotiate what that severance package will, will look like ultimately, right? Right. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Um, and then I guess kind of another specific situation that uh, I think we're hearing about it more and it's, I, it's not because it wasn't happening before, but it's just because it wasn't as widely talked about is, um, LGBTQIA plus based violence. And for so long, you know, these things weren't um, talked about for, for many different reasons, obviously. Um, but is that something that you specialize with as well? And like, how does the approach kind of change or does it change? Uh, I would imagine you probably approach everybody with the same, obviously. Um, but uh, yeah, like what kind of resources are there available for them for support? And yeah. Um, and yeah. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I, so uh, the, protected under the code, uh, the human rights code for sure. There, are, you know, code grounds specifically for gender identity, gender expression, um, uh, sexual orientation. Um, so all of those things are covered, and and those folks are definitely protected and within their right to file applications if they've experienced discrimination on the basis of their identity or sexual orientation or gender expression. Um, so, for example, the way they dress, um, mm -hmm. uh, and that includes preferred pronouns, uh, then it, it also has to be within the context of those things I told you, the, the social areas, we call them. So was it at a service or in employment or in housing? For example, those are the three main ones um, that they experience this discrimination. So that includes, you know, on a bus or by a medical professional or in your job, um, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of cases that have gone to the tribunal specifically around gender expression where um, perhaps somebody who is transitioning from male to female wants to start wearing dresses, uh, but they work in a factory and the boss says, no, uh, you know, the dress, this is a specific case, um, no, the dress uh, is, is a safety risk. And, you know, is it really a safety risk or are you being discriminatory? So so those are the types of things that might be covered. Um yeah, in terms of anything different, um, I wouldn't say so. I mean, I, I certainly care about those issues a lot. Um, and I have a lot of clients that have experienced discrimination, particularly around their gender identity. Um, and I like feel pretty passionate about supporting them. Um, right. But it's the same process, you know, going through the Human Rights Tribunal, most likely. I guess the other thing I'll, I'll just jump back to the human rights process quite often, um, what you can do, especially with um, education, so schools, um, or uh, with employers where you're looking for like some sort of remedy, perhaps it's like an accommodation that you're trying to get. Um, an accommodation just means like where the employer, for example, helps you to be able to do your job just as well as everybody else, because maybe you have a disability that limits you. Um, and, uh, you know, in order to get that, sometimes you don't even have to go through the whole human rights process and file a complaint. Maybe the lawyer just needs to write a demand letter from you. Um, and, and sometimes that helps to have a lawyer write it because 
unfortunately that's the world we live in. There is a bit of an elitist <laughs> situation where people just respect when it comes from a lawyer, but that demand letter can sometimes get what you want. It's, it's almost like an immediate mediation where we say, look, here's the terms on which we'd like to settle this issue. And then we won't file an application at all. And sometimes that can actually get you resolved. Yeah, and it's kind of nice that you don't have to put them through that whole practice, pr or process of almost being re-victimized and having to, you know, relive all these details, which can be quite painful for people, right? So that sounds like a good option if you want to just kind of, uh, or hopefully avoid the process yeah. if you can, right? So. It's a good try, at least at the outset for some cases uh, yes. before you before you pursue the rest. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then the last thing I want to kind of think about, just like kind of thinking about how all these different groups are affected is, especially if this applies to youth. Because so I imagine that youth, um, if they fall into one of these protected you know, populations will be protected under this human rights code as well. Um, how, yeah, like, obviously, so are you working with the parents in that situation? Would the parent have to file it? Um, yeah, how does that kind of change the dynamic of this, uh, this whole process? Like, can youth come before the tribunal or? Yeah, so, so you're talking in the context of the education piece? Um, yeah, I guess, yeah, more so the education, like, yeah, discrimination, I guess, more so in the schools, because the workplace wouldn't really apply here. So more so in schools, I guess it would be, or other services, perhaps like a hospital or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So if it's a child that has experienced discrimination, um, they're still protected under the code, just like the rest of us. But yeah, it would be, it would be through the parents. So the parent uh, sort of makes the application or the complaint, uh, on behalf of their child, you know, in, in legal terms, it's often called a litigation guardian uh, in, in court uh, proceedings. But yeah, it's, um, parents are entitled to make uh, applications on behalf of their children. And then the, the, the resolution really is for the child. So the child would be awarded general damages, the child might be awarded certain accommodations. Um, and, and, you know, going back to that demand letter, contact, same thing. Uh, we could write a demand letter to the school, for example, and say, outline the law and basically say, you know, because like, like we didn't know about, you know, certain human rights things, not all employees of organizations that should know about it do, do right? So sometimes teachers might not even know, oh, gosh, I, I have a duty to accommodate. And that means that I have to inquire about what kind of accommodation might be available to you. And I can't just say no. Um, sometimes all it takes if we have cooperative people on the other end is educating them about, look, this is the law. This is what's required of you. Um, and this is what we're asking for. Yeah. So, yeah. The thing I feel like would be maybe more challenging with youth is like, unless they're telling their parents, like, for them being hard to recognize when something's actually being discriminated. Cause they, they don't know any the idea. Like they might feel that something is wrong or off, but they might not know they're being discriminated against as, as an adult would. Right. So that's good yeah, point. I can see that presenting a challenge there. So. Yeah. Good point. I mean, I think, I think, it, yeah, it, it is really up to the parents to identify, wait a minute, there's a problem here. Um, and then, yeah, getting getting help and support. There is like uh, Justice for Children and Youth, um, a, a great organization for youth if, if they have specific legal questions or concerns that they want to reach out to an organization about. They, they do uh, like they're like a legal clinic for youth. So that's another good resource. Oh, that's great. Is that just in Ontario or is that across all of Canada? It's just in Ontario as far as I know. I think they're in Toronto. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. I'm glad that things like this now exist. That's, <laughs> that's wonderful. Yeah. Um, and then I guess, yeah, like you've already covered quite a bit of them, so I don't want to, you know, you know, berate it too much, but like what other resources or supports should people be aware of if they think they have a case other than going, um, yeah, obviously seeking out little legal clinics, um, reading the code and being aware of it, um, consulting with a lawyer like yourself, um, what other resources if people think that they have a case should they maybe seek out? Yeah, well, maybe I'll, it's just worth mentioning now uh, at the end so that people have it. Is the two that I mentioned that I think are really just wonderful resources, uh, even I use them, uh, is the Ontario Human Rights Commission. Um, they have an excellent website and they have all these policies that, that give you very big details about what um, discrimination is, how the code works, what case law has been used, what um, employers should be doing. So it's even good if employers are listening uh, for you to read up on just so that you know what your duties are and so that you don't get yourself into litigation situations. Um, and then the other one is the Human Rights Legal Support Center. Excellent mm -hmm. resource, great online help. Um, and also just like, you know, wonderful to call or to email if you have specific questions. Yeah, no, that's, that's perfect. Um, 
Yeah, then I guess like kind of the last question I have for you that's more maybe on a personal sense is um, obviously working with people who are in such a vulnerable situation and these issues obviously carry a lot of weight, you know, things like sexual assault and discrimination and sexual harassment, all these things. Um, how do you kind of set those personal boundaries and not take it so much upon yourself, which I'm sure you've learned a lot from your time as being a counselor, but is that challenging for you at times or how do you manage that? Oh, absolutely. Uh, it's it's really hard. And I, I, I think even er, certainly early on in my career, um, before becoming a lawyer, and when I was, you know, a counselor, and I was hearing really harrowing, awful situations, I, I certainly uh, experienced some vicarious trauma uh, and, and burnout. And it was really hard. So yeah, I mean, I have found ways to uh, compartmentalize to switch off, you know, I have three small, awesome kids at home. So uh, I just find a lot of joy in spending time with them. I, I run and work out to try and switch my mind off. And I, I try and remember that I am only one person and I can only do so much, but I certainly try as hard as I can to do what I can. So. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, you definitely have to have those uh, those interests as it at work. And like you said, enjoy spending time with your family and just things to kind of take your, yeah, take yourself out of it. And I think that's huge what you said about being like, I can only do so much, you know, obviously you're always doing the best you can. And, and that's like, you know, as, as much as you can do at the end of the day, right? So. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. So I guess we'll kind of just wrap up with a few sort of like rapid fire questions for you, just more fun ones and <laughs> lighter since <laughs> kind of transitioning out of the heavier topics there. Um, but yeah, what is your favorite book or something you're reading right now that has inspired you or changed your perspective? Oh, gosh. Uh, <laughs> I'm really bad at thinking on my toes. Um, okay. Yeah, it could be no, a, okay. well, a documentary, whatever. So. Uh, yeah, oh, there is a really good book. Oh, where the crawdads sing. I read that last year and I loved it. It was so beautiful. I love beautiful writing and beautiful stories like that. So yes, that's yeah. my favorite book. Right you now. Movie? I haven't yet. And I really should, but sometimes I get really disappointed about, uh, you know, if I've read a book, they miss out so much, obviously in a movie and I'm like, but they didn't put that part in. And that was so important. So yeah, I, I don't want to d- no spoilers or disappointments, but I have heard the movie isn't quite as good as the book. So maybe yeah. you don't want to see it. So. No. <laughs> uh, but that's always one thing that, uh, yeah, can definitely ruin it. But de- yeah. definitely a good book recommendation. <laughs> uh, and it's nice. It's, so often lawyers put the podcast and they're, you know, like just throwing out all these like legal books or like psychology kind of books. But it's nicer to have a light, like a more like light. I mean, not that book's necessarily lighthearted, but it has a happy ending. So. Yes, and it's yeah, it's definitely not legal. I, I don't think I have any favorite legal books. Just so you know, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's nice to have um, to again separate yourself outside of work and be able to read things more for pleasure and not always just be in the. You know, Absolutely, that's yeah. another way to keep you know keep boundaries and and help not become burnt out. You know, I work every night anyway, uh, after the kids go to bed on, on my actual legal work. So when I actually have the opportunity to read, it's, it's for me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <That's amazing. laughs> um, and I guess, well, you probably already covered this question as well, because we already know your whole history now, but if you could work in any other career field, uh, what would it be? Actually, yeah, I don't know if I have covered that. Like, I mean, if, if skill was no object or <laughs> anything like that, no I think, yeah. I think I'd love to be like an artist. Yeah. Like, like I, I recently started my own TikTok page in October. And so I, I'm on TikTok a lot. And the things that I love the most are two things. Painters doing like process videos about like throwing paint on the canvas. And then it ends up looking like stunning. I'm like, wow, that's so cool that that's your job. And then the other one is cake decorating. <laughs> I'm really into like the, the really interesting, creative, elaborate cake decorating. So one of those. <laughs> so this is a very interesting contrast to the legal work that you're doing, which is very much, you know, like black and white. We're, I mean, there is still some creativity and interpretation and things like that, but um, yeah. yeah, it's very, very much in contrast. Um, speaking of the TikTok channel as well, actually, can you share a little bit more about that and what kind of content you share there? Because I'm sure that that itself would be a very valuable resource for people. Yeah, definitely. I I mean, a lot of what we've talked about today is what I do. I try and do short, well, I can, I, you know, three minute videos. I, I, it's hard to keep the law <laughs> any shorter than three minutes, but I do my best. Um, but I, really, I'm trying to give people the tools to to know, first of all, one, I have rights and here are what my rights are. But two, this is how the process works. So I break it down. For example, there's like a video just about like, what, what, what does mediation look like? Here's what happens on the day. Here's, you know, here's back and forth and and here's how it ends. Um, so really helpful, like little tidbits about different processes. And, uh, the thing that my followers love the absolute most of everything that I do is I do facts on Fridays where I review a case. Uh, 
like a recent Supreme Court case or a human rights tribunal case. And I tell you the facts and, and the details and the outcome and everybody loves that. So I, I might have to start doing that more than just on Fridays. Yeah, so. you know, funny. even I like I not that I necessarily always seek it out, but I, I do come across that legal content sometimes. And it is always very interesting, especially if you don't know much about law and you want to learn more about just these processes that work because they're they're all around us and we all have access to them but like you yeah. said the, the biggest problem here is that we have so little knowledge of how they actually operate right so, yeah absolutely or how we can use them and engage with them yeah i'm sure that that, that content alone has probably helped you know tons of people so that, that's great and i'm glad to hear more lawyers are getting on tiktok and putting themselves yeah. out there because i think a lot of lawyers are very fearful of that still yeah i mean i was too to begin with but i'm enjoying it and and most people are very friendly and kind so that that helps but yeah but yeah look me up at empathy lawyer all one word is my handle i love the handle too i was gonna say that's great great personal branding right there <laughs> <laughs> thanks i had some help <laughs> yeah that's perfect and then i guess the last yeah so just like we'll just kind of end by um other than the, the TikTok, you know, where else can people find you? How can they get in touch with you? Um, are you on any other social media channels? Or? Yeah, I'm also on Instagram, same handle at Empathy Lawyer. Um, you can also find me on the Rossa McBride uh, website page under Associate Lawyers. Um, and my contact information is there. You can also go through uh, uh, my TikTok or Instagram pages and you'll get to um my like link tree that has ways to contact me either through there or my email address. Uh, and I'm on Latik as well. So you can find me there. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And I, you know, it's funny. I've had now, well, this, you know, having several conversations on this podcast with lawyers, a lot of them wish you come from the Latik platform. And it's amazing the lawyers that I've talked to of like how much compassion they have for their work and also their ability to go above and beyond for their clients more than other lawyers that I've seen. I'm not saying logic lawyers are superior, but um, <laughs> I think there really is. And like, it just shows that because you're on a platform like this where you do want to, you know, have people be able to access you more easily. Um, yeah. That I've, all the lawyers, including yourself, seem to have that in common where they just really um, give their full self to this career. And they really have that, that extra level of compassion that, um, that's nice that I see. So that's amazing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much, Nicole. This has been um, a, a great conversation. And if you, yeah, please do go get in touch with her, follow her on those platforms. I will definitely be going and doing an Instagram and TikTok. Thank you for having me. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of the Legal Connect podcast. We hope you found our conversation informative and helpful in navigating the process of hiring and working with a lawyer. Make the process of hiring a lawyer easier than ever and ensure the best match possible through our platform, Logic.com. And don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next week.